Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having us. My pleasure. So, Elise, how do you describe this show to people? Oh, my goodness. Uh, Well, it's based on uh, an original vampire novella, the first one that was written ever before Dracula, even. Um, And it's a modern reimagining of that tale. So it's about a a girl who goes to university. Uh, She's from a protected small little background. And then uh, her roommate goes missing mysteriously. And it's a bit, uh, it's a bit like Scooby Doo mystery mixed with uh, Veronica <laughs> Mars, mixed with uh, a bunch of other things. And um, and her new roommate ends up being a vampire. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's a, a love story between the two of the between the two of them. What's not to like there, uh, <laughs> Natasha? How does this modern day Carmilla compare to the original novel from 1872? Well, the original novella was very much a cautionary tale about female sexuality. It was, you know, it was written during the Gothic era. And at the end of the novel, Carmilla gets beheaded for being (laughs) a lesbian, more or less. But uh, our little tale takes that story and turns it on its head and, and celebrates female sexuality. So how far does the original go into the lesbian? Like, is it just nuanced or is it obvious? I would say that, I mean, well, I think (laughs) for the LGBTQ community, it is definitely obvious, but I I think that it was very much nuanced. So, Steph, why do you think lesbian vampires have been traditionally portrayed as villains? Why such a bad rap? Well, like uh, Natasha was saying, the original novella was written as a cautionary tale because uh, this vampire, Carmilla, arrives into Laura and her family's life, and slowly but surely, Laura gets sicker and sicker, So, and then they fall in love, or at least Laura thinks so. So it's as if the, the lesbian is slowly draining her of her life force, uh-huh. and that's why people nowadays are like, you know, maybe that was kind of a bad story to tell. Yeah, and yeah. the point of our show really is to kind of subvert, uh, do the queer feminist retelling of that novella and kind of subvert those uh, those tropes on their head. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So, Elise, how would you say Carmilla compares to like Twilight, True Blood? Uh, it's way better than all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. Listen, True Blood season two. Yeah, that, that's okay. true. That's true. Yeah. Uh, no, I would say it's... Um, I mean, it started off as just like a, a little web series and it expanded and grew so much over the years. Um, but I think it has such a, a charm to it because mm-hmm. it really is just like storytelling in its purest form. It's just a, a girl at a camera, a bunch of shenanigans happening around her and, uh, you know, everyone puts their heart and soul into it. And I think that really shows in the mm-hmm. show. Nice. And it's written and produced and acted pretty much mainly by women. Yeah. Uh, Steph, how do you think that shapes how the story gets told? You mean behind the scenes or in the story as well? Ooh, both. Well, do tell. I think they really do kind of influence each other. And we do have a male director, but he is a lovely feminist man, and we all keep yeah. him on his toes. <laughs> Good. As you can tell when he goes out of line. Especially me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think what's interesting, you know, obviously the queer aspect is huge and tantamount and why a lot of the audience uh, came to tune in. But I think what's also really attractive to me as, you know, a producer and whatnot is that there are so many different female and non-binary and queer voices of characters in the show. So it, mm-hmm. the burden of being the female voice doesn't fall on one or two characters. Mm. You have a breadth of voices and point of views. And then some t- to the point where sometimes other people will come and be like, but where are your men, though? You know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Y- you really don't have enough guys. And I'm like, you know what? <laughs> Don't, all right. don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you explain the relationship between the series content and the sponsor, the idea mm-hmm. that Kotex sponsors the whole thing? Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, as my boss likes to say, no one tweets in anticipation of your next commercial. So our pitch to them was really like, let us develop a show that we personally feel passionate about. Let's build an audience. Um, and then... After the audience is there, we can also do some kind of branded videos where the connection to the brand is much more prominent. And we've definitely been able to prove a link between viewership and uh, awareness and appreciation of the product. And, you know, to their great credit, they took a chance on this. And I don't think uh, that's for every brand. I mean, their tone is very irreverent and fun. They like poking fun at themselves. So do vampires get their period, yada, yada, kind of fits in with our show. And the ethos of their brand is the same as the ethos of our show. Can you do whatever you want in the series, or do they have some kind of say in it? No. <laughs> okay. But, you know, and uh, I think they've certainly let us be as, be as very creative, but it's still, you know, we're working in corporate environment. 
And um, but the nice thing is we do have some freedom in terms of the storytelling. Like there oh, is no, um, you know, very overt product placement in, mm-hmm. the, in the series, which is nice because I think millennial audiences are also so attuned to that. They're aware when they're, be, mm-hmm. they're being sold something. So yeah, and we're just very um, transparent about that as well. We were honest from the get-go. Yeah, I wondered, because on YouTube, it seems so often as people get really uh, famous, they start getting a lot of hits. Mm -hmm. When they start doing those sponsored videos, Mm -hmm. it seems their fans get really angry. Mm -hmm. So do you think it's because you, you, right from the get-go, came in with Mm -hmm. them that you didn't have that backlash? Well, we it was towards mid-season one that we announced that Mm -hmm. Kotex was actually the financial sponsor. But like Natasha said, from the beginning, they knew someone was on board and helping us finance the show. Uh, and really, in this day and age, like the show is free, right? So we have to make it somehow. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And we're so lucky to have great partners that uh, mm. really believe in the show. And, you know, it was kind of a learning curve for everybody, including us. And mm. I think when they saw the real potential of what uh, this can do, I think it's a really interesting new way, new business model. Now, in so many TV series it, you know, or horror movies, you have one lesbian and one black character, and they generally get killed off seconds in, so early on. Um, it, it, people actually refer to it as the dead lesbian syndrome. Uh, yeah, ha- have the debates around that informed how you make decisions in the show? Well, Carmela is already dead. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good yeah. answer. So if you'll, yeah, yeah, I think uh, our audience uh, knows, and and if you watch it, that uh, all the characters that die have the tendency to come, come back. back. Oh, right. So, except the but old think, man in season two, he did. Yeah. yeah, he's not coming. He's back. real dead. Yeah. But I think another awesome thing about the show is that uh, the queerness is just sort of something that's there. It's it's the norm of the show. Mm-hmm. It's not um, you know talked about in detail it's just sort of like Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people a lot of characters are queer and that's it Um, was it a conscious choice to do it that way I mean I'm just an actor (laughs) but um, I think that was that was definitely part of it you know and also you know part of selling the show is we're doing a retelling of Sheridan Le Fanu's novella people know it's a lesbian vampire novella Mm -hmm. but you know you still have to yeah Mm -hmm. I think and in terms of people dying, like, you know, if most of the characters are queer, someone has to die. <laughs> and then True. it's just someone's dying instead of the queer character is dying. Yeah. It's yeah. just. Now, you've got millions of viewers and um, uh, crazy fans uh, called Cream Puffs. Yeah. They even write fan fiction. They make fan art. Uh, Natasha, what do they tell you it is that makes them so dedicated I think that this fandom was just so desperate for representation, and I think that's what makes the show so important to them and what makes it important to me as well. Um, So I think that they're just really able to identify with the characters and even identify with us as actors, I think because we're all pretty open, honest people as well, and and we're pretty proud to work on it. Um, That creates such a, a great fan loyalty it's it's just incredible how many stories I hear about how our show helped them come out to their parents or, mm. or how it, it saved their lives. And and in many ways, it saved mine, too. I mean, just hearing that. it's So often as an actor, you know, I, I've said this before, but you take what you can get, especially when you're starting out. So yeah. the fact that I get to work on something, that we get to work on something that has social responsibility is mm-hmm. such a mm-hmm. gift. It and is aimed at a, a younger audience, but uh, in full disclosure, there are all kinds of middle-aged lesbians, including the two at Mayo's, who are binge-watching the series. So clearly what we missed in our 20s we're making up for now. Elise, how would you describe your relationship with the fans? Uh, I mean, it's definitely, it, it's been pretty incredible. It's been such a learning experience for me as well. Um, but like Natasha said, some of the best moments are when you hear stories about how the show has really helped people. Because that's, you know, that's all mm-hmm. I want to accomplish as an actor. I want to, like, put something out there that's going to help people. Um healing through art. And uh, I was on Toronto Island one day and, and a girl came up to me and I think she was 13 or 14 and she recognized me and, and she she had like scattered away from her friends and she's like, I just like nobody, none of my friends know that I'm out and or like I'm not out and nobody knows and I just like, I'm, I'm so thankful to you and your show. Like it really is like I have a community of people that I can talk to online because I can't talk to my friends at school about it. And I think that's like, that's mm. the really incredible thing yeah. is that there's a community within the fan base as well mm-hmm. where 
where they can share and they can talk to each other and they can open up to each other yeah. when they feel like they might not be able to do that with their families. Do you think this could have worked on television the same way it does on YouTube? No. Mm, that, really? that, no, probably not. It's a really good question. I think it depends, especially now with the way TV is going, where even bigger players are realizing that niche is the way to go. Um, there's certainly pressure to make it wider and broader. There's always pressure. But um, this is a nice a start, question. though. I think yeah. that yeah. there's potential for it, it to yeah. be developed into television. And I think that would be really important as well, because I think the type of representation we have on our show isn't um, super present on mm -hmm. television. Mainstream, so that would be yeah. wonderful. Yeah. But the great thing about it being online is the way that it's told in the vlog style, which mm -hmm. is very charming yeah. and very campy. And then it also allows, as Lily said, fans to chat with each other online. I mean, we have a huge yep, uh, following on Tumblr, and that's what made it popular. So I feel like it wouldn't have expanded quite as much, and also globally as well. Yeah, because, that's a great point. Um, we have a lot of wonderful Canadian fans, but it's also really neat to to have this be seen all over the world, mm -hmm. and we wouldn't have had that opportunity had it been on television. So, so that's true. true. That's true. It's not yeah. geo-blocked, and everyone watches at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And just to go back to what you guys were saying earlier, I think it really is a testament to the two of you and the chemistry Natasha and Elise have in the fact that, you know, there was a stationary camera and there's two actors and there's great words and uh, that kind of spoke for itself in reaching millions of people. Mm. Now, season, the last season ended with a betrayal of loss and trust mm -hmm. um, just between you and I. No one else has to know. <laughs> um, what, can you give us any inside info on season three? Season any three hints? is an epic season. Like, yeah. it really does feel like a Greek tragedy that's Ooh. all coming together and it's very conclusive and um there's, there's a lot of tragedy of, like, is the right word for this season it feels a lot less stressful than last yeah don't you think yeah. yeah there's a lot of like rebuilding of trust mm -hmm. and um um yeah a lot of love and a lot of uh a lot of healing gets mm -hmm. done in season yeah. three mm -hmm. i think i mean like, we can say that laura and carmilla are stuck in the magical and it, the, the magical library together this season mm. so uh Two two exes. They're exes in close quarters. <laughs> so some there's definitely a bit of drama, but uh, I think they really learn how to understand each other and, mm -hmm. and trust each other again and become yeah. friends as well. Yeah. Well, there you go, dear listener. Cryptic <laughs> hints, but hints nonetheless. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Thank you Thank so you much so for much. having us.